Long. I am the senior director of the Dupree Center. Um, and you may see Paul Matsushima, my colleague, jumping in uh, here and there to answer questions, um, especially uh, via chat or drop in links that you might find helpful. There he is. Hello, Paul. Um, uh, Dr. Todd Bolsinger is with us. I will give him a more formal um, intro in a minute, but just to sort of name all the people on the screen. And we work at Fuller, and specifically this um, webinar is brought to you by the Dupree Center for Leadership. If the Dupree Center is brand new to you, if that's um, an organization that you've never heard of and you're here because you think Todd is awesome, let me just take this moment to tell you why the Dupree Center um, is equally as awesome. The Dupree Center exists really to help leaders across industries um, respond faithfully to God in life and work. Um, we, many of our resources put a lot of uh, attention on the work part. Uh, we think God has a lot to say about leadership um, and about work, and that's a space that we kind of go after. We do that uh, through a myriad of resources and experiences. Um, we have a daily devotional. Um, we do, uh, man, and we really just do, you know, kind of lots of digital things, especially in this time. And as you can imagine, how leaders respond um, to God in different industries looks really particular right now. And uh, we've been taking this up in lots of different ways, um, from thinking about how to lead in a crisis to what is God and saying when we're in lockdown to today's webinar about Christian innovation in uncharted territory. But before I um, get sort of get into that content a little bit more explicitly, I want to just describe a few features of how uh, we're going to um, kind of participate and engage. There are two features that I want to draw your attention to. One is the chat feature and the other is the Q&A feature. They are both at the bottom of your screen. The general rule is this. When we have a question for you, we would like you to respond in chat. When you have a question for us, we would like you to utilize Q&A, okay? So let's test this out. I'm going to ask you all uh, the first question. And what we want to know is this. Um, so start dropping these answers into chat even as, even as uh, we get going here. We want to know where you're at and um, kind of your context for leadership. So that might be the profession that you're in, the industry that you serve, um, how you're making sense of that seasonally, really anything you want us to sort of know um, about your context. I already see people dropping that in there. It's absolutely perfect. Um, this will just help us know who we're talking to and for you all to help know who's in the room. Um, okay, so again, if we have a question for you, we'll want you to use the chat feature. If you have a question for us, and this will be even more relevant, especially as Todd gets into the content, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom, and that's where we'll want you to drop uh, questions. Let me just say at the very top, I expect that we will get way more questions than we can respond to in this time, and that's what we're hoping for. If that happens, what we'll do is Todd um, will specifically go back through some of those questions in the next week or so, and we'll send up uh, send out follow-up emails. So let that be your permission not to come up with the one perfect question that you have to get um, answered here, but really to be asking questions as they come up, even if they don't um, get answered here in this webinar. We'll do our very best to answer as many of them as possible um, in a follow-up. Okay, so we're here today to talk about Christian innovation in uncharted territory. Goodness, this is a weird time, right? This is just absolutely a weird time um, on any given day, any given week. Um, I'm either talking to people um, or living in my own life. And we're just like right in the mix of grief and creativity. We're like mourning things that were and trying to get our head around things as they are. And at the same time, needing to kind of like imagine and think creatively about what's next. Uh, and, you know, we think that the story of uh, Christ has a lot to um, say about that, that our faith has a lot to teach. And uh, I am really grateful that we have Todd Bolsinger here to help us uh, just kind of make sense of that space. Todd um, is uh, Vice President of Leadership Formation at Fuller Seminary. He's also um, an Associate Professor of Leadership Formation. Todd's really done a, a lot in his time at Fuller. Um, his most recent project is to run uh, what we call Fuller Formation, which is really a platform um, for uh, spiritual formation, really kind of anywhere you are. I'll share a specific resource to that in a minute. Um, but beyond sort of this, you know, kind of impressive resume, Todd is just one of my own like real life leadership heroes. Uh, I find that he's got a way of putting frameworks around things that we're all feeling coming up from the fray and really naming and observing what's happening. Um, so, so that'll be really good. 
Todd's got a best-selling book, and it is called Canoeing the Mountains. Um, Paul's going to drop in a link to that right now. Uh, and this is a book that's been out for a couple of years now, and it really is about Christian leadership in uncharted territory. And if there were ever a moment that we could agree together that we're in uncharted territory, that would be now. Uh, so I encourage you to look at that, even look at that while we're talking. Um, if you haven't read that, pick that up. Uh, but I'm also especially excited to announce that Todd has a new book coming out. Um, it is called Tempered Resilience, How Leaders Are Formed in the Crucible of Change. And I'm going to be honest, I got the privilege to look at an early manuscript copy of this. And I think I read the early manuscript like two or three times. It's that good. Um, and, and I was pleased to find out that you can pre-order this book um, as of now uh, through the IVP, InterVarsity Press website. Uh, so Paul will drop in that link to um, I imagine even now, but especially a year from now, six months from now, we're going to be looking back collectively and maybe even currently on how this season built resilience in us. And so I imagine that book is going to be uh, just a really helpful framework. For those of you who are church uh, leaders, whether you're a pastor or you're involved in church, uh, Todd has a brand new resource um, up on uh, on Fuller Formation, and it is all about uh, really how to lead in a pandemic, guiding your church through a pandemic. So if that is a very specific uh, kind of niche need for you. I encourage you to dig into there. Um, but really, we're asking the questions today, like in this uncharted time, like what should survive? What should we leave behind? And how do we take the very best gifts of our organization to address the true needs of our community? And with that, Todd, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Michaela. It's a really nice to, to be with all of you. I've been sitting here smiling as I've been watching all the names come up on chat. A bunch of old friends and good colleagues and uh, some people that I have not met yet from literally all the world. Uh, Scotland, New Zealand. It's really amazing. So nice to um, have a chance to spend some time talking to you because we're in a unique place, right? The world changed on us and changed dramatically on us in the last uh, few weeks. And what I want to talk about is how this becomes a moment not only for our the very most compassionate, empathic responses to, to the disruption, but how we can literally find the way to begin to lean into this disruption in more innovative ways. And so if you are a person who has gone through any kind of personal disruption in your life, you lost a job, you had a change in location, you had a disruption through a health crisis or maybe the loss of a loved one, um, then you already have some of the tools at your disposal. You have more um, resilience and more capacity than you might even know. And then now it'll be an opportunity here that literally we share across the world um, for the opportunity to think about um, how to be innovative in a time like this, particularly for, uh, for me as a Christian and for us at the Dupree Center um, in a way that is honoring to Christ. So we're thrilled to have a chance to spend some time with you. I'm going to share my screen and talk through about uh, 20 minutes of material or so. And then we're going to come back and Michaela and I are going to have a conversation, which is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, Dr. Michaela O'Donnell Long has been my co-teaching partner in my do uh, Doctor of Ministry of Leading Change the last two years until the Doctor of Ministry office figured out that she should have her own class. So now she doesn't teach with me. She's going to be teaching some of her own material and, and she's uh, also going to be published uh, this next year. So I love whenever Michaela and I get to work together. So, so, um, so let me share a couple of thoughts from you for you about this and we'll I'll walk you through this whole notion. Um, let me ask you where, where, just I want you to think about where were you when the world changed for you this most recent time around? Um, for me, I was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and uh, that sounds like an odd place to be for me, a person who spends all my life in places like Los Angeles and Seattle, uh, uh, Austin, Texas, New York City. Um, I was coming back from a trip that had taken me to Nashville, Tennessee, and then to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and on the, the, that was on a Friday. The Tuesday before, I had sat in a senior administration meeting at Fuller where we were talking about um, this COVID-19 coronavirus and how we might need to start thinking about contingency plans for our fall quarter, I mean, our spring quarter. And I was in deep denial. I just have, I look back now and think about the fact that as a person who spends my life talking about leading change, I did not want this change to happen. I looked at all the work we were doing and it felt like it was going to be completely disruptive. And I literally found myself in the meeting saying, do you think we're overreacting? Two days later, I get on a plane 
and to Nashville, Tennessee, we are spending uh, in some awkward moments where we are thinking, hearing things like we shouldn't shake hands. We were doing elbow bumps and kind of laughing about it. I, I fly into Sioux Falls, South Dakota, have a great um, conference with a group of pastors and church planters in that, that region. And one of them looked at me and said something like, well, you know, I wonder how much more traveling you're going to be doing. And I laughed, ha, ha, ha. And then I got on the plane and went to Denver. And by the time I made the connection from Denver to Burbank, our campus shut down the following week. I was told not to come into school. I had to get on the phone with our senior administrators. And I began to go through the process of preparing for the fact that not only was I going to be sheltering in place, but our, our entire fall quarter was disrupted at the school. And I remember the experience deeply feeling as if something not only had changed in the world, but that something had changed in me. Well, just a few days earlier, I had been grappling with, I now found myself not only embracing, but needing to um, be mobilized toward. And so as you think about this for you, uh, how did it ch change for you? Um, maybe you could just chat in. It's just a good thing to do if you could just put in so everybody else can see it. When, what was the first sign that the world was changing for you in this crisis? Do, when do you remember it? Was it uh, uh, early February, like my, my son in Seattle, who uh, was trying to tell me in mid-February, Dad, this thing is coming? Um, February 29th, the very first person died in Seattle. Um, I was on that plane from Sioux Falls on March 13th. There's a two-week gap in there. Um, was it, how, how did you experience the world changing for you? When did that happen? And when did you become aware that you were being disrupted? One of the things that helped, I mentioned my son who lives in Seattle. I also have a brother who lives in Northern Italy. And I have a class, one of my students who pastors in New York City. And by the time um, I was home from that trip from Sioux Falls, I had been on the phone with my son. I had been on a chat, a text chat with um, my brother, and I was in a compline service Sunday night with my student in New York City. And I began to realize that what these were like dispatches from the future. These were people who were ahead of me in the experience, and they were telling me the, about their experience. I remember my brother in Italy writing, writing back to me three, two weeks ago. He goes, he said, actually, six days ago, I was in denial about this, Todd. And now literally people are dying. Please take this seriously. My son, whose girlfriend worked in a convalescent home in Seattle, was even more stringent. He was trying hard to say to his dad, dad, I'm glad they've canceled your speaking. I don't want you on a plane. He was trying to remind me that I'm actually closer to the age of vulnerability than I think I am. Um, and we were all of a sudden I realized their seriousness and their care for me and the way that my uh, student in New York City was talking about caring for her congregation um, began to make help me take it more seriously. I needed voices from the future to help me be present in faithful in the present. And it took me right back into my own training. One of the things that has deeply affected me has been uh, my colleague Dave. Dave Gibbons comment that he made uh, over 20 years ago from when he and I were involved in a Dupree Center Pastors Roundtable, almost 30 years ago now. Um, he said, the future is already here. It's just on the margins. What is this reminder is that wherever you live in the center of your world, if you are a person who uh, feels as if things haven't changed, then go ahead and think of your, then it makes sense that you might be a little self-centered. But if we become aware of the people who are on the margins or in different places who are experiencing different things, very often that's going to be the, the reality, if we can embrace it, that is going to disrupt us. And that those margins are also going to be when the center and the margins can, can interact with each other, can become the source of innovation. Um, one person put it this way, whenever the margins can interact with the, and he said it as a as a cute, uh, poignant, pointed pun, the dead center, then innovation happens. The future happens. Uh, think about this as the center as being the place of power or privilege or security, the place where we have, a, have ability to be insulated from some of the changes and the margins where the changes are happening. Whenever that interaction can begin to happen, there can be actually be deep, and the um, disruption, but also the potential for great innovation. Um, I'll share this a bit about my own life, another uh, bad day for me. I, I often learn through my own kind of uh, stumbling into my own stubbornness. 
So in 2017, um, I was asked to move to another role at Fuller. I had been the vice president for vocation and formation. I'd spent three years helping put spiritual formation and the formation of vocations into the center of our curriculum. And in 2017, I was asked to take on a new role where I would take all of our outward facing centers, like the Dupree Center and the Fuller Youth Institute and the Brem Center and our Fuller Center for Missional Formation. And we would link them together and we would ask the question about how we could serve the church directly. How could we take the research and resources of the Fuller Seminary and give them directly out to the church for people who don't necessarily need our degrees? They don't need to become students. They just want our research. They want our resources. They want oh, the best ways we could serve them. Um, how could we make that available to people who don't need more initials after their name or don't want to take on more debt? And at the same time, we began to ask the question, how could we serve them better? And we created the leadership formation division. And we began to develop this thing that we have now developed called the Fuller Leadership Platform. And when this was just starting, one of our trustees, who is a lawyer in Silicon Valley, said, hey, you know, what you're talking about is doing actually kind of an entrepreneurial startup within a conservative institution. You might want to talk to some people who do that for a living. And so he, I flew to Silicon Valley and I gathered in one of those amazing kind of uh, uh, lawyer's office conference rooms or on a famous street in Silicon Valley. And around the table were all of these folks who were all been involved in startups. Some of them were um, uh, McKenzie consultants and former McKenzie consultants and others of them worked for companies whose names you would all know. And you know, a couple of them were with institutions and they were all those kinds of folks gathered and they were all Christians. And they said, so God, tell us, give us your pitch. Pretend that we are going to fund you. We're not, but give us the pitch about what Fuller wants to do to make a difference in the world. And I went, great. We want to serve leaders who don't need our degrees, but they want our resources. We want to figure out how to serve them and care for them. They said, great, launch into your pitch. Ten minutes later, I finished my pitch. I was, turned off my PowerPoint. I was kind of proud of myself that I kind of nailed it in the time. And I looked around the table, and they were all smirking at each other. And I couldn't figure out why they were. And then all of a sudden, one of them looked at me and said, you've been doing that talk around Fuller a lot, haven't you? And I went, oh, oh, yeah. I've got administrators and trustees and faculty members and students, and i got to recruit staff. I said, yeah, that's great, because you just gave us a pitch on why this great new idea would be good for Fuller. You didn't tell us anything about why this would make a difference in anybody's life outside of Fuller. You know, Todd, nobody outside your organization cares about your organization the way you do. Um, nobody cares about your organization. They only care if your organization cares about them. You know, what you probably need to do is spend more time listening to people outside of Fuller in order to understand whether Fuller has anything to offer them. And then he went on to say, you know, it's a little bit like the parable of the the whole story of the Good Samaritan, like, you know, what Fuller's trying to talk about is, can you become somebody who really loves your neighbor? I thought any time the venture capitalist is giving a Bible lesson to the theology professor, it's a bad day for the theology professor. But that's exactly where I found myself. I found myself thinking about my own institutional survival. I was part of an ongoing conversation about the way in which the world is changing in higher ed and in theological education. So we've got to be innovative. But our emphasis of our innovation was internal, not external. It was about the way we change for ourselves, not for the way we make a difference for somebody else. Who are the default voices that you tend to listen to the most? Think about this for a second. This might feel hard, but who are the voices that come that when you are thinking of an idea, you are thinking of a concept, are they the external voices? Maybe some of you are ahead of me on that. Or are they internal voices? Are they the stakeholders, the funders, the administrators, the faculty in my case, the choir if you're the pastor? The, um, these are all important people. But we start realizing that we tend to default to a certain kinds of voices or people, oftentimes those that are at the center, then by listening to them the most, it'll shape the way in which we begin to innovate and have you rethink this whole notion. If you're familiar with the story of Lewis and Clark, then you will be familiar with the fact that, they, that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark were men of the Enlightenment. Meriwether Lewis had been tutored by Thomas Jefferson. 
they had been sent in the core of discovery to find a water route that would be at the center of the economic policy of this new nation, the United States. Uh, the water route would connect the Mississippi River to, through the Missouri River and across to what they believed would be the connection to the Columbia River that would take them to the Pacific Ocean. And if they could own that water route or claim that water route, they would actually claim the trade route. It'd be like having Amazon today. <laughs> and that was the entire center of their worldview. There's a water route. Economics depend on water. We got to claim a water route. And so they were water guys who took boats that they invented up the Missouri River to the source of the Missouri River. And one day, Meriwether Lewis walked up the side of the Mid Lem High Pass, believing that he would have a short portage. They would carry some canoes. After 18 months of going up upstream, they'd put them on a canoe, a river on the other side, and they would get to go downstream. They would then float to the Pacific Ocean. They would get there, they'd take a selfie and send it back to Thomas Jefferson. They would turn around and go home. They would be the people who found the Northwest Passage. And in that moment, as they went through that experience, they found themselves um, walking up to the side of the Lemhi Pass, looking over, and as you know from the story, discovering the Rocky Mountains, 300 miles of mountains. They were completely disrupted. Two parts I always like to highlight. One is that the Mandan tribe, who they had spent the winter with, told them there were mountains. And they said, no, no problem. We're good at mountains. We've been navigating the Shenandoah Mountains for years. We're from Virginia because we're from Kentucky. They had no mental model for these kinds of mountains. And the second thing is they'd seen the Rocky Mountains for three months. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean if you've ever been to uh, Eastern Colorado, Kansas. You can see the Rocky Mountains on a clear day. But Meriwether Lewis had written in his journal, I refuse to believe this will be anything but a safe and comfortable passage. Denial runs deep. But when they walked over the Lemhi Pass and they saw these mountains, they realized they had that everything about their world was disrupted. And so at this moment, they had to drop their canoes and they needed to find horses because they were lost. Dayton Duncan, who was a writer, said, they knew less about the American West than Neil Armstrong knew about the moon. Neil Armstrong had seen pictures of the moon. But when they stepped over that Lemhi Pass, they had one person who wasn't lost. They were in Shoshone territory, and they had with them a Shoshone, a teenage Native American nursing mother named Sakagawea. They were men of the Enlightenment, but they were also men of their era. And because they were men of their era, they valued white men and they valued educated, experienced white men. And here they were with a woman, a Native American, who had been a slave, and they needed to learn how to listen to her. She was the expert, Sakagawea. And because they listened to her, and they were able to find the Shoshone and find the horses, and the Shosh by collaborating with the Shoshone, and being humble and working with them, they were able to make their way to the Pacific Ocean. I often like to think about the fact that we, I needed myself, I was having a Chicago we a moment in Silicon Valley. I was being told, hey, you are a person of privilege and you're the person of the institution and you're the person of the organization. And even though you care deeply about change, you're used to listening to only certain people. And in a dramatically different world, the more that you can listen to the Chicago we the people whose voices have been neglected, the more you can begin to be innovative. So let me give you a, a couple of thoughts that you, we can use to stimulate your thinking about innovation in uncharted territory. The first part to recognize is that when you take an organization in uncharted territory, you, the only currency you take with you is trust. So the level of trust in your organization is tested at that very moment. And every single time you take people into uncharted territory, especially when you are leading in what we would call adaptive leadership, where you are literally leading without expertise. You are, this is what happened to Lewis and Clark. They were now, they were water people who were expert navigators of the known world who are now having to lead into the unknown world and they had no expertise. All they had was the trust that their men put in them. And you've got to be people who continue to work on and build trust. I say refuel on trust 
because every single decision you make, every single crossroad you face, every bit of pain that everybody experiences in your organization are, is going to require you to expand trust. And the only way you rebuild that trust is by demonstrating both competence and congruence. I noticed I said competence. You don't have to be an expert. Um, we trust people who are competent at what they do. So a leader who can say, hey, look, I don't know exactly what we're doing, but here's what we will do. We will take care of our supplies. We will take care of each other. We, will, we have got a plan worked out. We're going to find the Shoshone. We're going to work with them. Um, we're going to be peaceable with them. We're going to work with them to find horses. We may not have a perfect plan, but we demonstrate our competence as leaders. And second, we're congruent. We need leaders in uncharted territory who will not lie to us. We need leaders in uncharted territory who will be congruent. They'll be the same person when they're facing a challenge as they were when they were experts. And that continues to bring trust. Trust, uh, it, it, when trust is gone, the journey is over. The second thing, and this is what I learned in that Silicon Valley boardroom, is that the focus has to be on the pain points of the people you serve. Whatever you're doing in this moment, what to innovate, if you're a church leader or a nonprofit organizational leader or a business leader, the focus at this moment has to be not on your own organizational survival, but on how you serve the people around you. Your focus on the pain points of the people that you are trying to serve is going to not only give you credibility, but it's going to give you a reason for being. So as much as it is so tempting to want to focus on your own survival, innovation doesn't come from institutional survival. I, I consulted with a president of an institution, and I said, what is your vision? What is your reason for being? And he literally said, in a changing world, it's surviving. And I thought, no one is going to invest any money in your survival, any more than those Silicon Valley people told me they were going to invest in my product um, because it was going to be good for Fuller. So focus on the pain points of those you serve. Make your, learn how to be listener, listeners um, who are focused on the people around you. Three, find yourself a few Chicagoias. Find yourself anybody who is the voice that you haven't been listening to. Add more talented, diverse voices to the table. Find the people who have been living in uncharted territory already. Um, for me, in this COVID thing, I needed to listen to my son, my brother, my students. I needed to find people who were living in a different reality, and I needed to take them seriously. I needed them to mentor me through my de denial. In, a, in the church situation today, we are finding ourselves needing those of us who've had robust church ministries and strong organizations and big donors and big endowments are now having to ask, how do we function more like the nimble startups, the small nonprofit, the home church, the organization that is good at working through and bootstrapping itself into the future? They're the Chicagoias, they're the voices from the margin. And then when you start moving forward, experiment. Try some modest experiments, safe experiments and aligned experiments. Uh, the uncharted territory isn't the time for you to become what you're not. It's not a chance if you're a small church that is focused deeply on um, having deep relationships. This isn't, this isn't the time to try to have a big television ministry on Facebook Live. If you're an organization that's really good at caring for the poor in your neighborhood, care for the poor in your neighborhood. If you're trying to bring um, products and m things to market that have serve a particular need, this isn't the moment for you to try to become some Fortune 500 company overnight or exploit a problem. It's instead trying to uh, focus on your core values, what is clear and unchanging about us, what is it we believe deeply in, and our charism. What is our gift? I love the word charism. I got this from a professor, from a president of a Christian school in Canada. He said he believed that every institution has its own charism, like, like the Catholic orders. You know, they're all into the Catholic church, but Benedictines have a different charism. Uh, they're about work and prayer than say Franciscans that are about hospitality and evangelism, or uh, about Dominicans that are about preaching, or Jesuits that are about starting new initiatives for the sake of the glory of God. What is your charism? Do you know your gift to the community? Do you know your gift to your, to your uh, clients and customers? 
do you know what it is that you do uniquely well and how do you do that and experiment around those aligned things and then lastly train others i believe deeply we are going to be in a deeply distributed world um, I've, uh, Andy Crouch and others are right about the fact that this is not just a blizzard, but it's going to be a, a, a new little ice age, then we could be disrupted for the next two to three years. And we are going to, and our capacity for innovation is going to be on our capacity to invest in and develop leaders, Lewis's, Clark's, Chicago, we is, um, to be able to take the core piece of what we have, some of us have had in terms of our own power and privilege, our titles, our, our offices with our heavy furniture that are now closed and think more and more about our ability to train and develop other people, to work through and delegate other people. I also think for those of us who are Christians, one of the cl clear things that this has demonstrated to me is that the underlying condition of the church has been a lack of deep discipleship. And that underlying condition now has revealed itself at this moment. And that if ever before, if you're a person who is engaged in faith-related leadership, your ability to pass on and work with people as dis to be a discipler and a disciple maker is going to be more important than ever. Eric Hoffer says, in times of great change, learners inherit the earth while the learned of a the person is that you'll be focused more than anything on being a learner and learning your way through. Yeah, in Silicon Valley together. try some aligned things and to focus on training others. For the next few minutes and figure out what questions we can bring together. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, I think, Todd, your internet has um, just started breaking in and out in that last little bit. So I'm gonna try and lead you towards some uh, questions that may help us fill in any internet glitches. Um, I, uh, you know, just to remind everybody, uh, this is a time to go down. If you're on a computer, I think it's down. If you're on an iPad, I think it's up. If you're on a phone, um, my goodness, maybe it's on the side. I have no idea. Um, it's a time to go straight to the Q&A and see it and kind of start to work out uh, the questions that you have um, based on all that Todd uh, just said. Um, and I think I really I think we lost just about um, 60 seconds. So I don't think it was too much more than that just for your framing, Todd. Um, but let me start uh, with a question um, for you. Todd, can you hear me? Todd, can you hear me? Can everybody else hear me? Okay, great. So everybody else can hear me. Todd is Todd is having difficulty. Todd, I am going to trust that by the time I get done with a long-winded question, um, uh, we can um, re-engage you. Um, and if not, um, then uh, we'll just kind of go from there. So one of the really interesting things, um, Todd, that you were saying there uh, and that you were talking about um, is this kind of relationship between survival um, and what actually happens. Uh, you said, um, oh, are you coming back on a different capacity? Well, let me just see if I can articulate this. And if I have to run with it myself, I will. Oh, I see more of a Todd face. Okay, Todd, can you hear me? Can I get an audio, uh, just a confirmation that you can actually hear me? Can you hear me now? Yay, you're back. Okay, <laughs> I'm hoping you stay back. Otherwise, I'm gonna just, you know, riff on all your material and keep going. Um, okay, so Todd, one of the things that you talked about that was really striking to me was this, you know, kind of nobody else cares as much about your survival as you do. You need to um, be able to actually meet their needs. 
And one of, one of the conversations I've been having um, on replay with people lately is, is this dual label uh, sort of layer of survival. So certainly our organizations, our institutions, maybe our churches are kind of subject to an unknown future. But I mean, I think the new stats are like 32 million for unemployment claims. And on a very individual level, we're having this like, are we gonna survive? Um, and part of what I'm wondering if you can speak to um, is the relationship between us kind of dealing with that level of insecurity um, and sort of what do we do with that as we are trying to lead an organization that may or may not um, kind of be facing survival uh, in that way. Todd, did you get any of that? Are you there? I, I am here. Yeah, yeah. I just did that intentionally, Michaela, so you could talk for a while, so they could hear from you. So. Great, I'm glad. I'm glad to have no no warning that I will be on by myself. Um, Todd, did you hear my question at all about survival? If you could just give it to me again, that would be great. We'll start over. We'll start over. Yeah. Okay. So you said you said the word survival a lot. You talked about um, kind of the crisis of feeling like, is my organization gonna survive? Um, and that people on the outside maybe not caring as much about that. But I'm thinking about kind of on the in the very individual level. It's like, are we gonna serve like are we gonna survive? Are we gonna have a job? Is my is this thing gonna be here? And the kind of pressures that puts on innovation and what kind of internal work that necessitates to hold that kind of ambiguity. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that. Well, you know, so even just walking into the last minute, I felt more anxious about trying to get my technology up. I'm not even paying attention to my, uh, to my notes. So when we're anxious, um, we're not at our best, right? So in one sense, it makes sense to take care of ourselves. I, one of my favorite quotes from Trisha Taylor, who does uh, the Leader's Journey podcast, is she always likes to say, anxiety makes us stupid, right? We don't, we don't do well when we're anxious. So to own that, to be aware of that, like, I, like, I'm really aware that I was not at my best in that President's Council meeting when we were talking about um, the future of the school during COVID-19, because I was worried about, well, my six centers that all were having people flying around the country and the speaking engagements we have and the responsibilities we had. And I could see revenue going out the, co out the, out the door. And whenever we're focused on ourselves, we tend not to be very strategic. So the answer to that isn't to... to stamp it down is to actually acknowledge it. It's to actually pay attention to our anxiety, work our way through it, and then work on regulating our own position so that we can keep looking out to other people. And this is a very difficult piece. It's what leaders have to do all the time, right? Leaders have to be really aware that your capacity to be able to uh, lead change is in the moment of anxiety that you're experiencing also, that you're not immune from it. So I would always say, pay deep, atten closest attention to yourself. And then from there, recognize that you've got to be able to take steps forward and move forward. And, that, and it, what, that's part of what we, how, we, how we grow, how, how we move through it. That's helpful. I think I, uh, we have a question from Michelle that almost feels like the flip side of that. Michelle says, I always think about how resistance goes hand in hand with adaptive change. And yet resistance might look different right now when it's so evident that change is necessary. Can you offer some comments on the changing nature of resistance in this particular time and the implications of that for the people uh, that we're leading and the communities we're serving? Yeah, so I think the only way that I can think about resistance well is by recognizing that what resistance to change wants is the status quo. We want what's familiar. I always make this connection in my head. Familiar and family are connected. So even if my family isn't the best family in the world, it feels familiar to me when I get home, right? Um, even if I'm going back into my, uh, to, to, like, it's like, it's, think about this, whenever you're traveling around the world, if you see a person who you had in sixth grade English class, if you're in a foreign country, all of a sudden you wanna see them because they're familiar, right? So our resistance is about our longing for the familiar. So it shows up in lots of different ways, in lots of different ways. There's nothing wrong, it's normal, right? But to recognize that what change is gonna require us is to lean into that unfamiliar and be willing to learn through that experience of vulnerability. 
that comes through the unfamiliar. So resistance will show up really different in different places. And there's nothing wrong, again, it's very human. Um, even, in, even when I talk about sabotage, which is where people um, intentionally resist, like vehemently resist, I always say sabotage is not the bad things that evil people do. It is the human things that anxious people do. And so think about this, no matter how it shows up, resistance is a, is a desire for the status quo that keeps us from the new thing that could be developed. Yeah, what I appreciate about that is even the link in um, noticing the emotions that come in up in others with noticing the emotions that come in ourselves. So that it's not that anxiety is a blanket for everything, but you linked both of those. And I think that helps uh, with compassion, right? Both for ourselves and for the um, for people that we're listening to. Um, Rachel asked a question and I feel like she's been like reading my mail here. Um, you know, it's so like, there's just so much going on right now. Um, I'll speak from my own life experience here. I am like a mom of two small children. Um, I've got like a very tall workload. Uh, my husband works full time. You know, we don't have childcare right now. And um, all these rapid changes are coming, some of which I'm like, oh, that like I'm grieving those it sometimes is very hard to tap into creative and innovative energy in that space. And there becomes this cycle of it's like my, I was like, I, you know, we're supposed to be innovative and creative and yet we can't. And, you know, we even move to feeling unproductive to move towards, especially those bigger goals, but sometimes even the small stuff. Can you speak to how we tap into that creative and innovative energy in a season of collective exhaustion? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. So here's the interesting part. I'm sheltering in place with an artist, <laughs> like so, right? My wife is an artist, and one of the things I talk about with Beth all the time is that, and Beth is my wife. Beth is an artist. She's also an executive coach, so she it lives in this adaptive space with other people. But she really goes back into her studio, and she said, you know, there's a common thread, which is we always think that creativity comes from the muse, that it comes out of this like spark, where a lot of times creativity comes out of the work. That so, so when I'm most exhausted and when I'm struggling, what I intend to do is go right back to like the basics. I, I have this thing in my head when I'm struggling with a writer's block, I go back and I do something really boring. I go back and read my own writing. Like I try to remind myself, this is what I've written before. This is what I care about. And what I find is that it creates a momentum for moving forward. So even as we talk about innovation, you know, what did Lewis and Clark do when they got on the other side of the Lemai Pass? They figured out, okay, where do we get food? Where do we camp? How do we make friends? Um, yes, we're, we have no idea what the future is going to go, but we know we need supplies. We need horses. We know we're going to have to get other people to help us. So, so part of what we do with exhaustion is come back to doing the things, the next thing in front of us that begins to create momentum around us. It, it's, a, it's a weird jujitsu, right? It's a weird piece because it's not about some spark that sometimes we have. It's really about doing the work that over time begins to give us some momentum. Hmm. Yeah, and strangely for me, one of, one of my tactics is actually to move intentionally towards other people. So I tell the story of like the first, the first day, the day when I realized everything was crazy and our kids' schools were closing and my anxiety was just like up to here, right? Up to there. And I was like, we got to go to the store to my husband. And he's like, calm down. I couldn't calm down. The only thing I could think to do that potentially could calm me down was to go and knock uh, next door on my neighbor's door. She's 80. She lives by herself. And I knew that she would be potentially even more worried than me. And it was like move, intentionally moving towards somebody was like this little antidote for getting outside of my head, which actually is a really creative move, right? And so just the relationship, um, which sort of leads me to a two-part question. Well, well, Michaela, let me oh, stop. Yeah. You just gave the best illustration about caring, focusing on the pain points of the people you serve, right? You just, that was a way better illustration than I had because what you did is you thought, here's my neighbor who has a need, let's move toward that. And not only did that give you something to do, but it also, that it sparks our own, it takes us out of our own self-absorbed innervation, right? So that's a great example right there. Yeah, it, absolutely. And you're, and you're sort of learning, right, along the way what these pain points are. There's a couple of questions on pain points that I want to go to now. Um, and I'm going to ask them both and then see if I can dial in in the middle. Uh, you know, Joe asked, like, 
how do you focus on the pain point um, of your people when mostly what they want to do is, you know, get together and worship again and return to what was, which is both a return to what was normal and also a really like, you know, healthy desire to be together. And um, Lee says or asks, can you speak to how we balance compassionate attention to the pain points with also the necessary call to adaptive change, even if that's painful? So both of those questions together and the scenario I just gave you, it's like there's this like little bit of movement we've got to do in, in terms of helping people pay attention to what, you know, what they desperately don't want to, but desperately need to. In this time, again, it's clouded in a particular way. So, you know, how can you speak to that? So one of the most interesting things has been, so I've been listening to a podcast by Patrick Lencioni. We all know him at the table group. I've never met him. He's like one of the people I'd love to meet someday. He made this statement about the fact that he was really resistant to the idea of virtual meetings until he was forced into them. And now what it's caused him to do is pay attention to these deeper longings. And he made this great statement. He said, I think that when we return to work, we're all going to discover we can do a lot of work over, vi over video conferencing and stuff like this. There's a lot of stuff we can do here. What we miss is actually human contact. That what we need is less, like we're gonna, we'll probably give up virtual cocktail parties and dinners to have real cocktail parties and dinners, right? And he made this statement, he goes, I think I'm gonna shake hands less and hug more. Hmm. Like we're gonna, personal is gonna be even more dear to us because we know it's gonna be more costly. And I think one of the things we can say to our churches and to people is, we love gathering in big gatherings, but most of the time, some of those gatherings that we gather in, we probably don't need. What we need to ask ourselves is what is really life-giving? What's gonna be worthy of putting on a mask and social distancing and gathering together and, and, and structuring ourselves? The, the human contact is gonna be needed. So when you talk about the things that are vital to us, we can't get rid of that. We will not get rid of communion, right? We will not get rid of contact. But there's a lot of the stuff that we have created that are going to be infrastructural pieces that we might be able to let go and create whole new energy. Um, my, my daughter's a youth pastor. Literally, she can't do a mission trip. She can't do camp. She can't do gatherings. She can't do pool parties. So this comes back to like, what is she called to do? Or her job is to try to nurture the faith of teenagers. Okay, so how do I do that? And she stays connected and she uses technology and she's now thinking about what that will look like you know, six months from now and over the next several years, maybe, maybe for some of these kids, their entire high school years. So there's, there are things we're going to learn that are going to make us creative, but it's going to be by paying attention to our deepest longings and then reframing of, of those things and then re, rejecting and, and eliminating some other things. Okay, I, there's a couple of bits that I want to grab there, but I, I want to do it via another question. I think this question uh, sort of takes you back where you just were, but maybe in a slightly different way. Um, Yolanda asks, I mean, she says, like, I love what you said about this being a time to not uh, become someone that you're not, like, don't become someone you're not in this time, which, uh, man, that's, that was very grounding for me, too, because that's so much of what the easy, tempting steps are, or to, okay, we've got to do this, and now we've got to be these digital experts, and we've got to connect with people in these ways, um, yet, given the, the scenarios and the examples that you just gave, we also, many of us have this sort of deep seated feeling that a lot of things are going to be, are going to be changed in permanent ways. So how do we know, how do we discern like what to actually change and do differently and what not to? Yeah. So I don't have, I mean, I, I don't have a crystal ball, right? That would be the giant irony for me to talk about adaptive change and give you a technical solution. Here's what the future is. But I do think there's some things we can learn, we can use. Margaret Wheatley made this great statement back in like 1999. She said, talking about how the millennium was changing. She said, um, we can't predict the future, but we can prepare for the future. And we prepare for the future by the, de by the quality of our relationships, the way in which we know and trust each other. So that's why the first thing on my slide is about trust, right? But she asked, then she says, but the way you develop those relationships is in your work together. This is very interesting to me. The deepest relationships are going to become from our colleagues, our people who literally we join hands with in a common cause. So one of the things that we can do for the future is we can figure out who do we want to go forward with and what is it we're called to do together that is worthy of our being willing to drop a whole bunch of other stuff. So, so that's going to be some grief. I, I can tell you, there's a person who is 
like learned, you know, you and I both, Michaela, have had to learn how to teach online because online education is becoming huge. That's hard if your basic skill set is being a talking head, right? Like it's taught me how to think educationally, dip, pedagogically differently. And now I teach differently even face to face than I do because I've learned to teach online. So learning how to do that is, is a really, thinking about the core things you're gonna hold on to, the core people you wanna go forward with, the core mission that is yours to do, and then really being willing to just go to courageously through how much you can let go to create space for those core things is going to be really important. I love, I love that very clear thing of saying like, it's like, who do you want to go forward with? Um, and that, I mean, all the way back to, you know, the Silicon Valley uh, investors sort of return to the good Samaritan, right? Like, who are you on the way with? Like, who are you going with? And to trust that something comes out of there. Um, which, you know, Michael asked a question that is something I've, I've been thinking a lot about. So one of my favorite scholars, uh, Teresa um, Annabelle at Harvard, she does a lot of research on like, what facilitates creativity, what kind of environment, what kind of workplaces. And one of the things she'll talk about is like the freedom to fail and like safety and this sort of like this emotional state. Um, and when, and, you know, it's well documented and her research is good and I buy into it. Um, but that's not exactly where we are right now. Um, and I think Michael puts it well. Um, he says, so there's a difference, it seems like there's a difference between innovation that comes out of times of necessity compared to maybe regular times or even these safe creative times. Um, we see actually a lot of innovation happening right now, but it's a lot of like, this is stuff we have to do, not stuff we want to do. Can you describe what you see as a difference there? Is that healthy? Which part of those should we be giving voice to? Um, what do you think? Well, this is where, again, going back to the listening to the pain points of other people. I mean, to me, the, the story of, the, of the, the, the call to love neighbor has become more important to me than ever. Because what I realize is when I am struggling with, okay, what is the church supposed to do? I go back to Jesus disrupting the Shema, right? So Jesus takes the most important passage you can argue in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and disrupts it by saying, and what is like it is loving your neighbor. So now for me, what really ch challenges me as a Christian is I want my life to be something that God would say, uh, this, you are doing well done. And what God has said is most important to him is for me to love my neighbor. So my innovation now at this moment becomes less about where do I get to experience the goodness of my own creativity, though I want to bring myself to it. How instead do I bring myself to this very particular pain point of my neighbors? And so that notion of who am I called to serve? Where is my charism? What are my deepest core values? I think here we find the most amount of creativity actually in that juxtaposition of necessity and need. Hmm. Okay, so if that's like the all the way in moment, right? Like all the way into the person right in front of us. Um, I think David asked a question that's sort of like the zoomed out uh, kind of angle. And it's like, okay, um, and this is now my words, not David's yet. But it seems like COVID has accelerated so many things that were already in motion, um, particularly in like a work environment. And it's not the only shift in our midst. It's like a shift on top of shifts, if you will. Um, and does it bring to bear any particular other major sweeping forces that we ought to be paying attention to? And if so, like, where are the opportunities, particularly for like Christian leaders in that, in thinking about the kind of all the way zoomed out perspective? Well, I, I, you know, I can't say, tell that about every sector. I can talk about two that I think about a lot. One is this whole nation of education and training and formation. In a changing world, the idea that all your education happens in preparation for your vocation is completely blown out the door, right? We're all sitting here today learning as best we can. That's the Eric Hopper quote. We're gonna have a lifetime of learning. I mean, I'm gonna be, I'm teaching here, but I'm listening to other people or joining into other podcasts and stuff so that I can learn. So learning and learning in context, what, what this allows us to do, what online education allows us to do is to say, your context is actually even more important than our content. Like we'll give you content, your context, context is even more important than that. So 
taking seriously your con people's context and where they are. The, you're, every person on this call is the expert in the world they're in. That, that means that those of us who teach and shape and form need to be more humble than ever before. So those are the places where I spend a lot of my time. It's in the formation of people and the world of the church, and it's in the idea of learning. Both of those are now gonna be more contextual and more local than ever. And the great irony is that technology allows us to actually be more contextual. And I, it, I think once we get our head around that, we're gonna start changing everything. That's good. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I am going to um, let you answer this and then we'll do some wrap up stuff. Um, oh, I can't decide. There's two good ones. Todd, I'm going to ask them both and you can pick which one you answer. Okay. Uh, so number one is uh, kind of a Holy Spirit question. It's like, wh what's the role of the Spirit in all this? And like, what are we noticing? What are we paying attention to? Um, that comes from Spencer. And then from Tom Lane, um, you know, this is sort of building on some of the stuff that you said with Andy Crouch. Like Andy Crouch says that, that trust really is the primary currency going forward. Um, how can the church fan that flame? Yeah, yeah. So let me put it together this way. It's funny that Spencer, Spencer mentioned that because he and I spent a little time t t talking about these things. I believe the Holy Spirit is the gift of God for the church pulling us into the future. I believe in a strong eschatology. Like I believe that the spirit is what is renewing the creation so that someday every knee will bow and every tongue confess and someday every nation will become the kingdom of our God and that's Christ and he shall reign forever. So I believe it is the spirit that transforms us and invites us. So to spend time really discerning what is it that the spirit is doing that is bringing life that we can say yes to of that is really an important, important call for all Christians. And I think if we can have that power of just, if we can cultivate that level of discernment, people will trust us more. I think the reason why the church has lost trust is that we're not seen as being discerning. We're seen as being reinforcing of people in power and the status quo. And I think if we can be known as the people who discern the work of the spirit and humbly lead into it, as learners, learners mean disciples, I think we'll have more to offer the world and more trust to get, be trusted more. You know, it is, I, I think it's evident whether we're like humans working it out until the final days, but it, I think it is evident when we see people come together trying to trust the spirit. And I think that builds trust um, in ways. Uh, there's lots of other questions. Um, oh, Jonathan, you have a question directly for me. Okay, so I'll answer you. Um, in a follow-up, uh, there were more questions than we could get to, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get after those, um, and if you want to, like, even as I'm sort of wrapping up here, if you have other questions, even from some of the answers and some of the chat we've had just at the end, please drop them in, um, but um, otherwise, um, Todd, I just want to say thanks to you. Uh, you know, I, we get to have these conversations you know, talk about leadership and go through things. So uh, this is just fun to get to do this in a more public platform. I think it's really beneficial. And um, certainly we're um, only answering a smidge of things in an hour today, uh, but hopefully this has been generative uh, for our creativity and generative even to know, I, I think there's solace even in knowing we're asking some of the same questions, right? That feels like the spirit alive right there. Um, I want to encourage all of you uh, to go to and check out the Dupree Center website. We've got tons of stuff up there. Lots of stuff by um, Todd. Uh, Paul, Paul can drop in a link to his page. Um, I, I've got stuff up there. We've got a team of people who um, are taking up these kind of issues and writing and doing other resources. Um, so we'd be glad to glad to have you um, in that way. Um, in, in a, we will send a link out to this particular recording um, pretty soon, um, whether you wanna just pass it along and share or whether you're somebody who signed up and will be viewing it for the first time. Um, but then in about a week, we'll follow up with some of the answers to those questions. So that's kind of the rhythm you can expect. Um, otherwise, I just wanna say thank you. And Todd, I, uh, will you sort of send us out maybe with a, like a benediction for this kind of innovation in uncharted territory? You know, my standard benediction is that wherever you find yourself, wherever you find yourself, remember, you are right in the middle of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are surrounded by the love of God that sent him, and you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. More than ever, remind, remind, be reminded of those things. Wherever you find yourself, that's where you are. And God bless you as you do. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye.